Welcome to the ward. My name is Dr. B. If you haven't already, please don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like this video, leave me a comment, and if you'd like, you can join the memberships and whatever else. Check out the description box below for more information. Oh, and by the way, while you're at it, you should check out our new merch that we have in our store. It's pretty amazing. So let's get started. She was trying to get this dealer busted, and I'm dealing with a Detective Terry in um, Seattle Narcotics. Caitlin Moore is an alias given to the dealer who procured drugs to Kurt Cobain in 1994. Caitlin becomes a, an important person in this investigation because she's claimed to have been with Kurt during the days that he was in Seattle. According to Courtney Love's father, Hank Harrison, he did an investigation of his own and published it in a book called Love Kills. As part of his research, Hank interviewed multiple people who were close to the Cobains during this time. One of the people he interviewed is Caitlin Moore. Since Caitlin was never interviewed by police, this is the best that we have in terms of putting together a timeline and reconstruct Kurt Cobain's movement during the last days of his life. Saturday, March 26th, 1 a.m. in the morning. Kurt nods off at Caitlin's apartment on Denny Way. Caitlin left the apartment and went to Comet Bar. When she returned at around 2 a.m., she finds Kurt still in the same position on her sofa. She finds about six condescending messages on her answering machine from Courtney, asking about Kurt and commanding basically that he get on an airplane and fly out to Los Angeles. Caitlin calls Courtney back and promises her that she will kick Kurt out first thing in the morning. Caitlin said she woke up at around 11 a.m. Saturday morning, and true to her word, she kicked Kurt out. Kurt wasn't happy about that. He tried to tell her that he's been receiving death threats. Caitlin assumes he's making up a story to gain sympathy. He asks her again to stay at the apartment, but Caitlin, fearing Courtney's wrath, says no. Caitlin told Harrison that Kurt did not want to go back to the Lake Washington house. She offered to give him a ride wherever he needed to go, but he declined and just left. Meanwhile, Courtney is in a phone frenzy, calling everybody across the entire country. That's one thing that is consistent across all accounts. Back at the Cobain residence, Callie is alone with one of his girlfriends, Jessica Hopper. Jessica was in town from Minnesota. She was 15 years old at the time. Callie was 20. During this time, Callie said he had a $400 to $500 a day drug habit. He said he would bounce back and forth between the Lake Washington house and his other girlfriend's house, Jennifer Adamson. Jennifer was also a teenager in high school. Unlike Jessica Hopper, Jennifer also had a drug habit. As a matter of fact, Callie reports that she was selling it. So he would spend a lot of time at her apartment as well. 
Since tensions were so high and Kurt refused to communicate with Courtney, she began to use methods to try to control Kurt and the people around them. She phoned Callie and Renee Navarati, who were her two live-in male nannies, every hour at least. Callie said that his drug habit had gotten so bad at this point that he asked for Jackie Ferry to be sent to Seattle to pick up Francis. Hoping to avoid another tongue lashing, probably ignored her rap until she threatened to do something diabolical. My bet is she again threatened to take the baby away. Same thing happened to me 30 years earlier. This time, Kurt promised to fly to the Exodus Clinic by Wednesday night the 30th. That's when he bought the shotgun. Kurt's flight to Los Angeles was originally scheduled for March 29th. Chris volunteered to take him to the airport. Kurt drove his Valent to Chris's and left it parked with a for sale sign in the window. Tom Grant and Dylan Carlson would later find the car parked in the same spot while trying to find Kurt. On the way to the airport, Kurt and Chris began to argue. It is reported that Kurt attempted to jump out of the moving car, presumably because he was telling Chris that he didn't want to go to treatment and demanded to be let out. When they finally arrived at the airport, the confrontation between the friends became physical. Despite Chris's physical advantage over his opponent, Kurt managed to escape. He charged to the exit, screaming, fuck you, or something to that effect. Shelly, Chris's wife at the time, says, Chris drove back to Seattle alone, sobbing. He had such a huge, huge amount of love for Kurt. We both did. He was family to us. I'd known him for almost half his life. According to Cross, Kurt made several phone calls on this night, few to his psychiatrist, and at least one to Rosemary Carroll, his attorney. Carroll told him he had options, and she ultimately convinced him to go to Exodus, and his flight was changed to March 30th. Courtney also claims that she spoke with Kurt on this night. He told her, no matter what, just know that you recorded a great album. She said their conversation was pleasant. There's no record of this phone call. Using logic and the data we have so far, we can infer that Kurt's state of mind during this time was angry, distrustful, and feeling betrayed. His rage was triggered at those who refused to hear him out and continued to constrict him of his freedom. For example, Kurt's conflicts were limited to specific individuals, whereas others, like his attorney, are at odds completely with the reports that he was losing it. This is consistent with Kurt coming to resolve. Those who felt angry with are those who are being fired by Kurt. He was going on to do his own thing. In case you needed more evidence that Kurt was simply done 
and ready to move on with his life. Dylan's statements about Kurt's state of mind when they went to purchase the shotgun are further demonstration of this. Dylan says he wanted to buy a gun for protection and because of prowlers since the police took all his other weapons. That sounds reasonable. Frankly, it is even more likely that the blurry dope love had lifted from his eyes and maybe cleared his vision a little bit. He was seeing some dangers and some dangerous red flags. The paranoia? Well, it's not just paranoia if it's justified fear. He was a first-hand witness to Courtney's ability to manipulate her environment and the lengths that she would go to to get vengeance. For example, she tried to pay one of her nannies, Renee Navarrete, $5,000 to kill Lynn Hirschberg's dog. reading Vanity Fair, you probably think I swig Jack Daniels first thing in the morning after I smoke my crack and then don't see my daughter for 10, 10 days. Um. I believe Dylan was oblivious to the extent of the troubles that Kurt was going through. Though Dylan is Kurt's best friend, I believe that Kurt would not disclose his true plans to Dylan, knowing that Courtney has access to Dylan. And Dylan depends on both of them to make a living. Mark that another conflict of interest. Kurt returned home, stored the weapon, and was picked up by a driver. When they arrived to the airport, Kurt realized he forgot to take the shells out of his bag and asked the driver to hold on to them. The driver took the shells and still had them when he was interviewed by police. They were never collected into evidence. In Los Angeles, California, Kurt is picked up at the airport by Pat Smear and Michael Measel, I think, who is John Silva's assistant. He was taken to ex he meaning Kurt was taken to Exodus to begin his treatment. There he went through the intake process, which consists of a clinical interview in order to determine treatment planning. He was also seen by a psychiatrist who prescribed Kurt's Subutex. Despite having been evaluated by numerous clinical staff, none have found him to be suicidal. Gibby Haynes, a friend of Kurt's, said Kurt looked a little bit under the weather, just tired of being sick and tired. Can you blame him? Kurt attended a Cocaine Anonymous meeting with Gibby that evening. In the morning, Kurt attends a group session, an individual counseling session, a pharmacological evaluation, and all in all, spent a good chunk of the morning doing treatment stuff. He attended another 12-step meeting in the morning, and Kurt's counselor at Exodus was a guy named Neil St Stimson. This is what he had to say. I asked him if he understood the seriousness of this Italy thing. Man, you almost died. You have to take this seriously. Your drug abuse has gotten you where you almost lost your life. Do you get how serious this is? Kurt responded, I understand. I just want to get cleaned up and out of here. In his sessions, Stimson says Kurt rarely mentioned his battles with Courtney. Instead, he was worried of potentially losing a lawsuit with original Heart Shaped Box video director Kevin K. was what scared him the most. Kevin K had filed the suit on March 9th, claiming he, not Kurt, had come up with many of the ideas in the video. Kurt told his counselor he had thought about almost nothing else since KK 
Smith's suit had been filed and he worried the case would wipe him out financially. Quote, he told me his biggest fear was that if he lost the suit, he would lose his house. In the afternoon, Kurt hung out with Gibby again in the day room, reported to be in bright spirits and joking. Me and Kurt were laughing about what a dumbass a mutual acquaintance was for escaping over the wall. That evening, Kurt is visited by Nanny Jackie and Francis. The nanny confirms that Kurt was indeed given the medication for withdrawal, and Kurt complained to Jackie about battling Courtney over Lollapalooza. April 1st, 1994, Friday. At 1.59 a.m., there's a credit card transaction stemming from Los Angeles for $0 for a mail order. At 2.01 a.m., just minutes later, there's a $4,262.89 purchase that also took place in California, and that purchase was approved. While at the Peninsula Hotel, Courtney makes a purchase over the phone to an electronics retailer in Northern California. In an interview, Courtney Love shows off her brand new Macintosh that cost almost exactly the amount the card was charged. I believe it's safe to say that this particular purchase was made by Courtney Love. At 3.33, Courtney wrote a check for $3,500 that was declined due to non-sufficient funds. A couple of seconds later, she wrote a $3,000 check and that one was approved. From 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. approximately, Kurt is visited by Jackie Ferry and Francis Bean at Exodus. I brought Francis to visit Kurt in rehab. He sounded amazing. He seemed amazing. He was in this incredibly happy mood, which I just didn't get. I was thinking, God, for one second, maybe he really is for real this time. He was laying on it thick, saying all these incredibly complimentary things to me and being really positive. And that wasn't his deal, sitting around and trying to make the world look great. Usually he was kind of grumpy, but I just took it as a sign that it was a positive 24-hour turnaround. While Francis is visiting with Kurt, Courtney is across the street from the Peninsula Hotel making a purchase at Barney's for almost $800. What I found very interesting in Courtney's authorized biography, she claims she only found out on April 1st that Kurt pulled out of Lollapalooza. She says, the LA Times report that Nirvana was pulling out of Lollapalooza was the first time Courtney heard this. Amazingly, she didn't go ballistic. She knew that whatever happened now, Kurt would probably never tour again. Yet again, making another statement that is final. The authors of the book Love and Death assert that Courtney made two phone calls to the rock shop from the Peninsula Hotel. If you don't remember, the rock shop is where El Duce claimed that he met Courtney when she asked him to whack Kurt Cobain. She continued to frantically call everyone she could think of, trying to keep an eye on Kurt. 
She even called the treatment center multiple times, demanding to be put through, but Kurt declined those calls too. According to the biographers, Kurt was advised by his treatment team that he should not be in contact with Courtney. I'm not sure about that. Though it's recommended to remove yourself from toxic relationships when you're trying to recover from a drug addiction, no one can really tell a patient not to communicate with their wife. So Courtney came up with another plan. She enlisted the help of her friend Joe Mama Nitzberg and Kurt's guitarist Pat Smear to go visit Kurt at Exodus. His visitors arrived at approximately 3 p.m. According to Cross, Courtney had sent Mama to Exodus with a letter for Kurt, along with some candy and a fanzine she thought he'd like. Kurt reported he didn't feel that bad. Kurt, Mama, and Pat Smear went to the back patio so Kurt could smoke some cigarettes. They chatted for almost an hour about mostly small talk. Kurt had always wanted to go to art school and he told Joe that he was envious of that. Joe was left with the impression that Kurt was serene. Whatever had troubled him, he seems to have already made peace with it. Meanwhile, back in Seattle, if you remember Callie's 15-year-old girlfriend and Callie himself are home alone at the Lake Washington house. In addition to Jessica Hopper, there are multiple other accounts that confirm that Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love gave their nannies a credit card to use for everyday expenses. As mentioned previously, Callie DeWitt stated that he had a $400 to $500 heroin habit during this time. Well, on this day, we see another credit card attempt. This one takes place in Seattle, and the actual card is used. There are four attempts to withdraw $300, and all four were declined due to non-sufficient funds. That means that the actual credit card was in possession of someone who was in Seattle. I deduced that that would be Callie. This means that the credit card that we assumed was Kurt Cobain's was actually in the possession of their nanny. Between 6.50 and 7.20, there are six declined attempts to charge the account for the Barney's purchase that took place earlier in the morning. In other words, a check was written at 11.12 for an almost $800 purchase, and later these six charges would be the sales associates attempting to put the check through, and each time it was declined, because as we've already established, there are no funds on this particular card. So while these charges might look confusing, a deeper dig into them simply reveals that Courtney was writing bad checks. Joe Mama Nitzberg and Pat Smear left Exodus around 5 p.m. The last call from the Peninsula Hotel to Exodus happened around 6 p.m. There were 13 missed calls from Courtney to the Exodus patient phone. At 7.23, Kurt made a phone call to Michael, the same guy who picked him up from the airport, but he was not available. At 7.25, Kurt walks away from Exodus for a second time. This is not unusual for addicts, but it's also not unusual for Kurt. Kurt has a history of going to treatment, getting the medication that he needs, and then leaving. Hello? Courtney says she was on the phone with drug dealers all yes, over Los Angeles, over driving there, around to their houses looking for Kurt. It has also been reported Hi, that she um, attended a Julie concert Bernstein. this really night. To speak to my client, Kurt. Get him on the fucking phone! At 8.43 p.m., there's a charge for $478 on Kurt Cobain's American Express card that has never been Yes. entered or I'm introduced no, into no. evidence. Yeah, no, he also fine. called Seattle Limousine and spoke with Steve Morgan, who arranged for Kurt to be picked up at 
around 1 o'clock in the morning the next day. At 8.47 p.m., the Peninsula Hotel got a message for Courtney. According to Tom Grant, it is believed that this was Kurt Cobain calling Courtney. However, Courtney Love's father does not agree with that. And a lot of things killed him, but that killed him too. Linda Walker stated that she dropped him off at around 1.30 a.m. in front of his house. If it goes in, and the rumor, you know, once somebody, you know, I deny it, and I, and I can deny it all the way to the bank, and actually people will believe me if I deny it, if yeah. I say, you know, it, it never happened. So far, we've established that Courtney and Kurt are basically done, and Courtney is enlisting the help of anyone she can think of to get her information about Kurt, but also to try to exert control over Kurt. I mean, the people that hurt <laughs> So unethical with the people that I had to do this, I paid. Yeah. On April 2nd, there are four credit card charges for Delta Airlines. These are often attributed to Kurt, but I believe they were made by Callie. Harrison claims Kurt came home pissed off and kicked Callie out of the house. Interestingly, Courtney inadvertently corroborates the story by saying that Mike, meaning Callie, was bad and that she had found hair and spoons in his room when he watched his child and that Kurt was furious. He was firing Mike because he kept doing drugs. Kurt liked to take notes when he talked to someone and I have a note where he wrote, it's pretty lengthy. It's all the reasons why Callie can't be our nanny anymore, because he's continuing to do drugs and yada, yada, yada. Out of desperation, she plants a story with a source at the Associated Press. And um, he left, and I had come down to L.A. with the baby to support him, and our nanny to support him. And when he left, I got very depressed, and, um, and um, had to be hospitalized for a, a nervous, a, some sort of nervous breakdown. I can say that to them as a hospital worker. That way there's no drugs involved. Yeah. And, you know, the sympathy goes to me and Kurt doesn't get in any trouble because it looks like he's not supposed to be in rehab and he's in the first place. Then he felt pressured and so he jumped over the wall. All right, um, I mean, how's that for a spin? Then it appear that I attempted suicide. According to Cross, Callie and Jessica were fighting about his drug use and in a fit of rage, he suggested that she take an early flight home. Callie tried to use the $100,000 limit MasterCard Kurt had given him to buy her an airline ticket, but the charge was denied. He called Courtney to complain, and she told him that she'd canceled Kurt, Kurt's cards, thinking this would help determine his whereabouts. Jessica Hopper said, right around that time was when Courtney canceled all of Kurt's credit cards and that included Callie's cards. So he couldn't get drugs and he started to freak out. He was supposed to buy me a plane ticket home and all of a sudden he couldn't and I was panicking. I had to call my dad and say, I can't tell you the situation, but it's really bad and I have to get out of here and I need $600 for a plane ticket the next day.
Around 6 a.m., as dawn broke, Kurt appeared in Callie's room on the first floor of the house. He did see me when he got home for a minute. He kicked open my bedroom door and saw me in there. He was like, what the fuck are you doing here? You were supposed to go to LA yesterday. I was like, I didn't want to. What are you doing here? Everyone's looking for you. Courtney thinks you're dead in a ditch. He goes, okay, well, I'll call her. I didn't really have any reason to think that he was on, he was on the lam and hiding, but that was the last time I saw him. According to Jessica Hopper, the last morning I was there, right about 6.37, I woke up and Kurt was standing next to the bed. He was like, hi, totally normal. I talked to him for a few minutes and he made a joke. Something to do with the song, Skinhead Girl. Callie woke up and we told Kurt, you've got to call Courtney. She's freaking out. You have to call her. We gave him the number in some little address book and he sat towards the end of the bed and tried to call, but they wouldn't put him through to her room. He was trying to do that for a while and I fell back asleep. I woke up maybe an hour later and he was sitting at the foot of the bed looking at a copy of Puncture magazine. I said something like, did you get through to Courtney? He said no. The TV was on. It was a Meet Puppets video on MTV. I don't think he said anything about it. He was just watching. I don't remember him being dressed like he'd been out, although it was probably warm enough that you could be out in just a sweater. But I got the impression he'd just gotten there, like he'd just walked in. He was casual. He didn't seem more high or sedated than normal. He seemed normal. And he was being jovial with me. I hadn't seen him since New York. So then, I fell back asleep, and he was gone. Gray Top Cab's driver, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this, W.A., picked up a passenger at the Cobain residence at 7.30 in the morning. His report reads, He picked up a person who he thought did not match with the residence. He drove around looking for a place to buy bullets, but was unable to find one. This male told the driver that he recently had a burglary and he needed to buy bullets. The driver dropped the man off at 145th and Aurora because he said he was hungry and wanted to get something to eat. The cab fare was $27. I woke up a few hours later. Callie had called a limo service to take me to the airport. That might have been around 11 a.m. I got up. I'd been eating Diet Coke and bananas for days. I'd been sick while I was there. And I remember leaving, but I was so freaked out at leaving Callie to die there, I threw up in the driveway before getting into the limo. It was from the anxiety. I could tell something really bad was going to happen. There was a TV tray next to the bed with this pre-prepared syringe of Narcan wrapped in masking tape. Death was in the house, waiting. It was on April 2nd. There was a block on the phone for everyone but him. I did not sleep. I called the operator every couple of hours to make sure in case they changed shifts. They all knew that if Mr. Cobain called, put that fucking call through to me. 
At 8.54 a.m., I was not asleep. He called, and for six minutes, he tried to get through and could not. For him to argue for six minutes on the phone is crazed. I cannot imagine him arguing for six minutes. He did, though. And what that told him is that I was on their side, that I had a block on the phone for him, and I didn't. Kurt's whole plan was to try to wear everyone down, but he could never wear me down. I think, though, that at the very moment he thought I had given up. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, the press always perceives me as, like, you know, completely tragic and fucked up anyway, and I have, like, a record coming out, so, you know, selfishly, it might even help sell records. <laughs> I don't know, my record's coming out in like a week. Yeah. So, you know, and I've learned the value of this. I didn't think it when it first happened, but all publicity is good publicity to a certain degree, unless yeah. you're Michael Jackson. Um, what should I tell the Associated Press? I mean, oh, you don't think you would ever find out that you never really were in the hospital? No. No one will tell him. Okay. I mean, the people that, <laughs> so unethical, but the people that I had to do this, I paid. How's that first been? Then it appear that I attempted suicide. While she was with us, uh, she said, I'm going to kill myself a rock star someday. Don't you worry, I will kill myself a rock star. She used to say that. She used to go around the house saying that. And a lot of people just disregarded it as stupid. But we, it, it was shudderingly scary. Because the way she said it was, you had to be there, but, you know. So we knew that, that it was something wrong with her. Uh, but we didn't think she'd actually kill anybody, see. Well, when Kurt died, when, Kurt got, when they got married, I thought, oh, this is cool. She's going to rehabilitate herself and everything's going to be fine. Because I was stupid. You know, I mean, I, I was naive about that. I thought maybe that'd be cool. She'd finally get herself straightened out. Uh, and they had the baby, so I thought I was going to get to see the baby. And that didn't happen. But one morning, my wife calls me from work and says, Hey, Hank, did you hear the radio? Uh, she finally did it. I said, did what? She, said, she killed herself a rock star. And then I listened to the radio and saw it on TV and I went into grief, you know, for a long time, about a couple months. I had to go through grief counseling. I had to go into grief counseling, you know? I really did. I was getting depressed, man. So in the process of the grief counseling, I got out of that. I, I managed to make my way out of it. And Courtney, was calling me during that period and, and, and make, you know, she said, why are you in grief? Why are you having grief? I says, because Kurt died and I never got to meet him. She said, that's right. You never got to meet him. You haven't got any right to have any grief about Kurt. I says, no, the whole country's crying about it. Little 12 year old kids are killing themselves over it. She said, but you haven't got any right to grieve. You never met the guy. I says, well, I never met Abraham Lincoln either. But I want to write a book about him someday. 